Happy Thursday, June 15th to you all. I can't believe it's mid-June already. For today's episode, I have Rob Rossi from The Athletic joining me to go over the Jason Spezza news from Wednesday, what Kyle Dubas's first move will be this offseason, and so much more that's coming up right after this. Your Locked On Penguins, your daily podcast on the Pittsburgh Penguins, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Hello and welcome back to another episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm your host, Hunter Hodes. Remember to follow me on Twitter at Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter at Elmer's for Penguins. And of course, thank you all so much for making this your first listen slash watch of the day. We are free and available on all platforms. Today's episode is brought to you by Game time, you can download the game time app, create an account, and use code Lockdown NHL for $20 off your first purchase. Now, joining me now is Rob Rossi from The Athletic. And, well, Rob, first off, how you doing? Good. Uh, tough week at The Athletic, but, 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 uh, um, you know, it's kind of a weird time because the cup final ends and everybody thinks it's kind of slow. And then it, this is actually the second, second, second busiest time of the year uh, for a hockey writer other than the tra- trade deadline. So uh, more, more limited sleep and a lot of, uh, a lot of um, waiting on things you hear about to be finalized. Yeah, I mean, it's almost two weeks until free agency starts. It's just crazy how fast June has gone by. And it's been two weeks since Kyle Dubas was hired. And speaking of that, Rob made his first front office move um, outside of bringing someone in, I should say. He fired a few people a little over a week ago. Hired Jason Spezza on Wednesday as assistant general manager. I know a lot of people thought it was a bit weird that he is the assistant general manager when a general manager has not been named. But when you saw the announcement what, were, what was your immediate reaction to it well a lot like dubis um being a, a person that the pe- penguins were interested in once you know once it became available this was a sort of a an open secret right i mean uh spezza had resigned very quickly after dubis was fired mm-hmm. uh, or dismissed in toronto and you know i had heard as, as soon as Dubas started talking to the Penguins that, that Spezza would be either, you know, likely to join him, if not join FSG in some capacity. Uh, I think the, the, the first thought uh, as it relates to how things are going to be going forward is I think it just confirms what I've been saying since uh, Dubas was introduced. I, I don't think there's going to be a GM. Um, Dubas is running the show. There's really no need for a general manager. I, I don't, I don't see why he would put somebody at least right away in the position he may have been in where a GM didn't have full autonomy. Uh, I, I envision him hiring multiple assistant GMs, maybe even an associate. I think Spezza was probably the first of, uh, first of that process. Yeah, and, and that's interesting. And I, I know you've been saying that. I know Josh has been saying that on social media, and he wrote a column about it on The Athletic as well. You know, my, my, my thinking with it is, you know, I, I kind of wanted the front office to be shaped like Colorado's is, where Joe Sackick was running it for a while, but he was also grooming Chris McFarland during that time before he moved up, and then McFarland became the GM, and now he runs the show, and Sackick just kind of watches down on him. I was just curious if – because Dubas said he would – he was maybe going to hire one after July one. If he would hire one, have someone do like the financial slash salary cap stuff, learn the job, you know, just on the fly while Dubas, I think is making the overall calls. And then maybe, you know, a few years down the line, he maybe gives some of that power to the GM. Is that something that you could see as well or not as much? Yeah, I, 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 I mean, I have no inside knowledge of how Dubas is thinking on this, but it, it makes a lot of sense to me that you would hire multiple uh, assistants, uh, not on unlo- and may- maybe an associate, very similar to the way it was supposed to work with Jim Rutherford when he took over in Pittsburgh. Um, but, but I think the big difference is, is I, I do think under Dubas, GM might be a position that somebody can grow into. 
But um, look, Dubis, Dubis has been very clear. He he wants full autonomy of hockey decisions. I, I, it's my understanding that you know, the reason they didn't name him general manager is because they want him to run all of hockey operations, including be the decision maker with personnel. So, you know, primarily a GM does that. Um, this is just sort of a different title, and I think it's a. So it's a t- t- tougher one for maybe Penguin fans to wrap their head around because the only other president of hockey operations was Brian Burke, and he he didn't have autonomy. <laughs> he didn't really have a role. So um, I, I I envision multiple assistants that have specialities, much like Dubis started with when he was an assistant GM in Toronto. I mean, I envision you're going to have somebody who – is a, is a cap specialist, maybe a uh, developmental person, um, maybe somebody in analytics. Uh, I could see as many as three to four assistant GMs, and the, the, they would all have specialties, but they could also learn other areas where maybe they're lacking. I would hope if that's the route they're going in, they would be uh, forward-thinking enough to try to put um, – some people who are young, younger, uh, with experience that are qualified, of course, but but people that you know aren't just retreads and 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 quite frank, quite frankly, minority candidates, specifically a woman. I think this is a great opportunity for one of the dozens of qualified, overly qualified women in in hockey, uh, if not with an NHL team in the hockey world. Um, to, to get a real opportunity to build the last part of her resume to becoming a GM. Um, and I think with specifics to Spezza, I, I think one of the real important things is, you know, players respect former players, but they really connect with guys that they played against. And, uh, not that not that Dubas wouldn't have a, a very good relationship with um, Penguins veterans. I mean, he would, he will. Um, from what I understand, already it's developing that. But 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 I do think that if you're looking for somebody who can be in the top ranks of hockey ops and get the attention of of the big three. Uh, they competed against Jason Spezza. They respect a guy like Spezza. I think, I think that will be an invaluable resource to both Dubis and probably even the coaching staff. Yeah, I mean, Sid went against Spezza so many times over the years. Gino did. Chris, a ton of other players on this team did as well. So I agree with you there. I do agree, Ron, that – you know, I would not be surprised if a woman is in this front office. And I've said on this show multiple times that the time is coming when a woman is going to be a full-time general manager in this league. You know, I, there's Alexander Mandrake who's out there, Haley Wickenheiser, Megan Chaika. There's no shortage of candidates to choose from when it comes to that. And if they do go down the road, road Rob, where they name a few other assistants and associate, you know, I've dropped some, of, I've dropped some names on my show who I, they could be thinking of like Cam Lawrence, maybe Sam Ventura, Maybe Brandon Pridham, who of course is in Toronto right now and was worked really closely with Dubas. Do you have any names that Dubas could be looking to add to the front office outside of Spezza if he doesn't want to name a general manager? Not really. I mean, I I haven't heard any yet. I think how the situation falls out in Toronto will be interesting. He was mm-hmm. very well liked there. I wouldn't be surprised if Pridham eventually ended up in Pittsburgh. Um, uh, you know, I, I think there's a real opportunity here for 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 uh, Dave Beast and the alternate governor, the Penguins, who led their search mm-hmm. to hand over the candidates that he was talking to before he was hired, before they they went and turned down the road towards uh, Dubis. But I, I think Dubis, look, he's been in the NHL for what, not nine, ten years. Uh, was a GM for five. He certainly has his own ideas. I, I remember when, you know, covering the transition from Craig Patrick to Ray Shiro, and it really took Ray Shiro, you know, a good year and a half to really build the foundation of his staff. I mean, 
Uh, he brought, he was hired in 2006 and it was the next summer when he brought in uh, Tom Fitzgerald and Jason Bottrell uh, who became invaluable pieces to him. So I don't think this is something that right away all these positions get filled. And I think that's why Kyle was very open about how he'll be, you know, he, he said he'll be interim GM through at least free agency. And then he, when I asked him about it, he said, if we go the route of GM, I think he's processing the type of front office he wants to build. I know the Penguins want him or FSG wants to expand their um, analytics department. Right. Um, whether that would create an opportunity for somebody like Sam to come home. Uh, you know, I, I think the thing about Sam and I mean, I would, I, I would love for Sam to return to the organization because it's, you know, it's his hometown organization, but he's got a really good job in Buffalo with an up and coming team. And he, and my understanding is his doesn't have to be in Buffalo every day. He can, he can work from home here. So, I mean, a lot of people have good jobs, but I would, I would especially look towards, an expanded analytics department. And I'll be, I'll be curious to see, you know, a lot of the scouts that are in Pittsburgh, some of them even still date back to the Shiro era. And I think they get maybe too much flack because the Penguins generally don't, they haven't prized draft picks, but um, you know, it'll be interesting to see how many of them stay versus how many Dubas wants to bring in and, and how he arranges his scouting department from, you know, European to North American to territorial and all that. Uh, but I don't think all of those things get done right away because there's so much to do right now. They have to really look at like they're they're fortunate in a way they got their core and they have coaching stability. It doesn't it doesn't appear any way that any of their assistants will be moving on. Um, so I think what you have to look at now is probably where we're headed next is them internally making decisions on, on some free agents and, and really letting the scout, the amateur scouting team continue to prepare for the draft. Um, I would imagine as is usually the case, Dubas will be sort of only involved in that from the standpoint of, you know, having the opportunity to uh, make the final call, but I think he's going to trust the scouting department on that. He also has knowledge of what this class is going to look like based off the time he was with in Toronto. I, also, if they want to hold the pick, I'm, I don't have a great feel for that. Uh, we did a mock draft at the athletic uh, this week. I think it was a second mock draft. And um, I know I traded the pick twice. I traded down in the draft and then traded that pick for a, for like a third line player because, and I, I gave up uh the Cal Granlin is part of the first trade because I just don't know how they, I don't know how valuable that pick is. I I've seen some people on Twitter be, well, you can get a top, you can get a, like a, a big piece for the 14th pick. I, I don't believe that. I think, I think it, I think if you can use that pick to maybe rid yourself of a bad contract and get another asset in return, that's about the best you could hope for. And I think that would be a big win for the Penguins because they, they ha ha have enough cap space right now to be active in free agency. But if they could rid themselves of one of their, you know, bad contracts without having to buy it out, you know, we're looking at probably Grandland or Petrie if we're, if we're realistically talking buyouts. Um, I think there's a lot of decisions to be made right now. And so I think Spezza... And uh, Dubas are going to be focusing on those decisions, letting the scouts continue to do their thing with the draft. Um, and then at the draft, we're going to have a convergence of some things. So if, you know, <clears throat> fans, I think should be paying attention a lot the next two weeks, but I would imagine these next two weeks are going to be primarily for them reaching some decisions on, on a Tristan Jari on a, how they handle a Grandland laying the foundation maybe for some trades they could make at the draft or shortly between the draft and free agent period and then see where they go. Yeah, no, this is the, these, these next what 14, 16 days basically are going to be, I would say very busy, you know, whether they're working up the arena or at Cranberry at the facility, it's going to be pretty crazy. And I would not be surprised now that the season's over, especially Rob <clears throat> moves can happen at any time, even though there were some trades that happened during the final, which I'm sure the league was not, 
happy about. As for the pick, I do think this is a deep draft. I'm going to have my big board drop, um, at least for Penn specific players next week. And I, I do think there are some really good players there, but I also do understand where you're coming from, where <clears throat> you can trade the pick along with Mikhail Granley, maybe move down a little bit in the draft. I'm kind of eyeing Chicago a little bit if you want to trade down to 19 and maybe move on from Granlin there. Uh, but that would do it for this first segment. Coming up in the second segment, we're going to get into a whole bunch of other things regarding Kyle Dubas, whether or not this team needs another legit star to, account, to contend, how much of a say will Mike Sullivan have in roster decisions, and what will do Kyle Dubas attack first. That's all coming up after this. But before we get into that, Buying tickets to your favorite events should not be stressful. Game time is the fastest and easiest way to buy tickets for all the sports, music, comedy, and theater near you. With killer deals on last-minute tickets and their best price guarantee, you can stop stressing over the tickets and start getting hyped for the fun that you will have. It's the price for, it's actually the place, excuse me, for last-minute ticket deals. Forget planning months in advance. Game time has deals on tickets right up to the day of the event. You also get exclusive flash deals on tickets for football, basketball, <clears throat> baseball, concerts, comedy, theater, and more. The Game Time Guarantee means you'll always get the best price. If you find tickets in the same section and row for less, Game Time will credit you 110% of the difference. It's the fastest-growing ticketing app in the country for a reason. Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off your first purchase. Terms apply. Again, that is create an account and redeem code LOCKEDONNHL for $20 off. Download game time today. Last minute tickets, lowest price guaranteed. All right, I'm back in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I'm Hunter Hodes. That is Rob Rossi from The Athletic. So, you know, as you mentioned, Rob, it's going to be very busy these next couple of weeks. I do want to ask, what do you think Kyle Dubas's first main decision will be with this roster? What do you think he's going to tackle first? Goaltending, buying out slash trading Mikhail Granlund, something else? What, what are you thinking when it comes to that? I I would imagine the priority is 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 goaltending. Um, figuring out where things... I, I, f- first, he probably comes into this with some leaning of where he is with Tristan Jari. And he definitely comes into this with a working knowledge of what the market will be. Um, and excuse me, uh, allergy season here in Pittsburgh. <laughs> so, uh, but also, um, you know, that was kind of a bugaboo for him in, in Toronto, right? I mean, I think if people are going to be fair, I think Kyle did a really good job of maintaining a core of stars and filling out a roster. I think he did a really good job of that, but because it's a flat cap, there's, 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 there's always an area where um, maybe you're not as, you have to be more creative than you want, or or you you just have to be creative, I I should say. And I think uh, goaltending was that area in Toronto. And I, I believe Kyle is very attuned to where the game is at from both a, development standpoint from a player evaluation standpoint and also from a salary cap and where where the trends are headed and my guess is he has a number and a term in mind for what he wants to spend on a goaltender barring something unexpected like you know um this is hypothetical please don't think i'm reporting this but like there's my guess would be there's a plan A, which is focus on Tristan Jari, evaluate Tristan Jari with your coaching staff, come to a point where you want, you know what you're comfortable with paying him and for how long, and then negotiating and then making a decision, right? You're either going to, hey, Tristan, you know, we're not close, test the market, we'll do our thing. If there's an opportunity to get back, if not, best of luck to you or the opposite scenario. Hey, we're very, you know, we're on the same page here with what our expectations are. Uh, I don't think he would be against re-signing Tristan Jari, um, but he has to evaluate him and he has to talk with his coaching staff, right? Uh, um, uh, Mike Chiodo and, and, and Mike Sullivan, right? Um, so that's like plan A. Um, I think then plan B with the goaltending is work the phones, get a sense of where things are in places where 
maybe more proven goalies might be available or goalies that you like that maybe um, you feel would fit better in Pittsburgh, perhaps even as a, as a, as a partner with Tristan Jari and, you know, try to try to figure out where that marketplace is. And then while you're doing this, leave open the possibility between now and the draft of if something comes up that is completely unexpected, say Connor Hellebuck becomes available and you, you, if by chance you have an opportunity to make that move, and I, I think the Penguins would lack the assets to make that move unless a team like Winnipeg was desperate, right, uh, to just unload Hellebuck. You, so that's like a three-tiered approach. And then while you're doing that, and I think this is where a Spezza can come in, um, and along with other people that are holdovers on the staff, you're figuring out what your options are, for Macau Granlin, you know, maybe, maybe they like him, this new regime. Maybe Mike Sullivan looks at him as like, look, he was miscast in the role we brought him in at, but, you know, in a different role, say if Jason Spence is not coming back, maybe Mikhail Granlin becomes a winger in the top six, and then it's a different conversation, right? I, I think you're figuring out about Granlin, you're figuring out about Petrie, I would imagine, and that's not a knock on Petrie as much as he's a big ticket player. Um, Dubas may have a different assessment of him than uh, the previous regime did. Dubas may like him better. You know, uh, um, Dubas may view this as like defensemen sometimes struggle in their first year in a new system. And I like what Petrie bring. I mean, I think there's all these evaluations, but primarily you start with goaltender because that's the most important position you have to address. And, and also it's the toughest to evaluate. Yeah. He, he's alluded to this Hunter, right? Like, um, it's very volatile. Yeah. It's, it's, I, I look at goaltending as a Molotov cocktail, <laughs> you know, like, and just look at the Stanley cup final. I mean, neither of the goalies who both played superbly for their team to get them to the final were, were starters going into the Stanley cup playoffs mm -hmm. and, how many times, quite frankly, in the past five years, yes, you see Vasilevsky, who I think is still the best goalie in the game, and you, you see Carey Price, his last healthy year, getting the Canadians, but mm. you also see a lot of different guys taking their team on deep playoff runs, and I think it's the hardest part of a management right now is trying to evaluate that position because – I can totally get behind the argument. If you have a stud, you pay him. And I could totally get behind the pre pre premise that if there's a stud available, that would more singularly help the Penguins than anything. But we aren't in an era where there are many studs and we you can put yourself into jeopardy by committing too much capital to that position for somebody to just fall apart. Yeah, I mean that, that's very true, and and I've been saying this for a while. You know, they they need to get at least average goaltending in the playoffs, and they haven't gotten that f for a very long time, which is especially annoying. Also, Rob, I, I did say you said <clears throat> if Granlin could play in the top six, which you know I know that's very hypothetical. God yeah, help God help us all. Uh, it'd be funny if Jason. You said Jason Spezza would play up there. Oh, Jason. Uh, yeah, Jason yeah, Zucker. Jason sorry, Zucker, but maybe I had Spezza to... will. You know, maybe he'll help the power play. Yeah, Freudian slip. I know, no, I had to make a joke about that. But no, I mean, Jason's, I saw, speaking of Zucker, real quick here, I saw Jesse Marshall posted on Twitter. He looks at the evolving wild or evolving hockey projections, but the evolving wild twins are awesome. And yeah. they have been projected five years times 5.1. And then for Pittsburgh, five years times 4.8. Rob, <clears throat> their projections are usually really good. Yeah. But that's, I think, too steep for Kyle to really go after right and speaking of has he really engaged zucker's agent because he wasn't really asked that during the press conference and i'm just curious to see how high up the priority list he is considering he had 27 goals this year yeah um i don't know if they've engaged my 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 suspicion was that those type of conversations were going to start happening uh towards the end of this week and into next week uh dubis has been trying to find a house um, an area to live. I mean, like there's real life things he's been doing. Yeah. 
Um, I, he just got an honorary doctorate from uh, Brock University yesterday. Um, uh, I, I think that stuff sort of, you know, he's probably placing a call, but um, that stuff will heat up pretty quickly here. Uh, I, you know, four, if you could get Zucker at 4.8 million, I'd do it tomorrow, but not for five years. No. Um, I just, I can't commit to that. Uh, especially given his injury history. I mean, his one healthy season in Pittsburgh was last year and he was fantastic. Mm -hmm. um, I, I think they should look to retain him. Um, I'd be willing to pay him five, five on a shorter deal, you know, maybe three years or something. I think he's that valuable to them, but I'm also of the opinion that even if you saw, even if you retain Zucker between Gensel uh, Raquel and Rust, you have to at least explore what each one of them could bring you back. If they approve the trade, Ru Rust and Raquel both have um, options in that regard. Um, Gensel's going into the last year of his contract. I think if you're, if you're going to make this team deeper, which look, the, the teams that made the Stanley Cup final had depth. Um, if you're going to do that, you're going to have to make a tough decision somewhere else. And I think having four grade A or at least grade B plus uh, overall wingers for your top two centers, it's probably a luxury compared to what your needs are in the bottom six. Um, and that, that will be a very difficult decision. There's, and there's political parts of this. I mean, neither Crosby nor Malkin would want Rust or Gensel gone. Rust just signed a new deal that, that generally doesn't send a great message. If you sign a guy to a long-term deal and then trade him after a first year, he has, he, in his first three years of his deal has, you know, a trade clause. Um, Gensel, I think would, would probably bring you back a lot, but, but maybe Raquel would bring you back even more in terms of the number of assets because he's, he's got a better contract situation. So I, I think they have to at least explore that. And um, again, I think those are decisions that they're, they're making, making now and then seeing if they can move on them. Yeah. And of those three that you mentioned, I do think Russ is, prob is probably the way to go. But as you said, it's, it's tough because he has the full no move clause right now. Only year one of this new contract. How do you sell that? I mean, he would probably, he would definitely be really gutted if Dubis went to him and asked him about that. But I think that's also just the nature of business in the NHL. Gensel makes six million for this season. I said on my show about a week and a half ago, Rob, after I saw the Cole Caulfield extension, he's probably going to ask for over eight million per season. Yeah. I think he's worth that. I think they're going to maybe look at an extension, but. You know, I've seen people say that you could trade him. I personally would like to keep him for this season because there's not a better winger on this team, and I don't think there's another one that's going to score you 40 goals, or at least 40. I, mean, I know he didn't have 40 this year, but I think he is a, a prime candidate to score 40 again next season. That will be interesting. You know, Moving on just a little bit you know, to, to Mike Sullivan. And I know Mike Sullivan and Ron Hextall, they never saw eye to eye. I mean, you wrote for The Athletic, Rob. He wanted them to go get Jacob Trickrin, but Ron Hextall didn't want to part with just draft picks. And that was he went for a very low price. Let's be real. He went for just a bunch of magic beans. I think Arizona overplayed their hand. And well, voila. When it comes to Mike Sullivan and Kyle Dubas, how much of a say do you think Sullivan is going to have in decisions for this roster? Well, he's going to be part of the conversation. He's probably going to be the most, his weight will be the heaviest other than Dubas. Um, you know, talking to people who, who were part of this process, Dubas was very excited to work with Sullivan, um, very uh, comfortable with Sullivan's, you know, um, position and influence in the organization. He really looks at Sullivan as a partner um, and I don't know why he wouldn't do this is a hyper intelligent guy. So is Sullivan. They're both excellent communicators. Dubas seems to want to build the type of teams that Sullivan likes to coach. Um, so I, I, you know, there was a lot of 
speculation about, you know, would any GM look at Sullivan and his contract and, and his closeness to, you know, the Fenway group ownership as, as a liability. I look um, maybe, I don't know, but as I reported this week, you know, Fenway just paid Kyle Dubas 5 million a year for seven years and gave him use of the company jet. So any questions about them having issues with either their GM or their coach should be answered. They, they like them both. Um, but I, you know, I, I've always felt it's not a bad thing if you have a little bit of differing opinion or, or push give and take when it comes to a coach and GM on decisions where, where what you can't have is what they had with Sullivan and Hextall, which was no communication. We don't really know how much they saw eye to eye because they Hextall just didn't communicate with Sullivan. Um, and towards the end, there was a lot of estrangement, but um, I, 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 Sullivan's got to coach this team. So he has to, he has to have a seat at the table and Dubas has to be able to say, look, at the end of the day, this is my call. And I think importantly, what Dubas has to communicate, and I don't think this is something Jim Rutherford did very well which is when I get a player, my expectation is this is how he's going to be used. So we're going to try him there until he proves he doesn't fit. It doesn't necessarily mean playing him with a specific line, but in a specific role. Yeah, that, that would make sense. And, and yeah, and Jim Rutherford, yeah, he, he would sometimes acquire players and Mike Sullivan just not use them. For big examples, Ryan Reeves. I mean, he was down even there for a full season before – Rother had to ship him out because it looked like Mike Sullivan was not going to use him in the playoffs. But I'm excited for their working relationship. I think with for their philosophies to how to build a roster, I think they align pretty well. And Dubas is a young enough guy where I think he's going to come. He's going to get players that fit his system, and he he's great at getting cheap quality depth in free agency. I think that's honestly one of the big things he's going to go after in free agency is some cheap bottom six players who can go in there, score you 10, 15 goals, something like that. But that which wraps is what up. They need, right. Which is really what they need more than anything. I agree. In, in addition to goaltending certainty. I mean, we forget because it was in real time, Hunter, just how inept their bottom six was at providing any type of, especially their third oh, terrible. line. Especially their third line. I mean, you, it's, it's ultimately what did them in. Oh, no, it was terrible. I mean, and they kept trying so many different combinations. I mean, Brock McGinn, you know, he's not here anymore, but he didn't really do much. Kasperi Kapanen, great that he played well in St. Louis, but I don't think that's going to last going into next season. You know, Teddy Bluger, all these other guys, it just – the mix wasn't right. And and I think Dubas, with his track record in Toronto, he knows how to build good bottom sixes, and I trust him to do that here as well. But that will do it for the second segment. Coming up in the – Final segment for the show. We're going to get into does this team potentially need another legit star player to contend? All that plus a lot more coming up. But before we get to that, we do have to discuss one of the newest sponsors of Locked On, which is Bird Dogs, which are very comfortable shorts. One, they make you look good. I've worn mine multiple times already this week, and they are tremendous. They stretch khaki shorts, and they are designed to fit slimmer through the thigh and leg, giving you a truly sculpted look. They also do the exact same thing as Lululemon, but fit way, way better. And they also fit way better than regular shorts that are made of a stiff, restricting cotton. They fix that issue by inventing cloud knit fabric that looks just like khaki, but stretches so you get a way slimmer fit without having to sacrifice movement. They also use anti-sting sweat wicking fabric that keeps you cool and dry all day long. And of course, your shorts don't stink during the day. You can go to birddogs.com slash locked on NHL for a free Yeti style tumor with your order. That's birddogs.com slash locked on NHL for a free Yeti style tumor. You won't want to take your bird dogs off. We will promise you that. All right. We're back here in this episode of the Locked On Penguins podcast. I am your host, Hunter Hodes. Follow me on Twitter, Hunter Hodes. Follow the show's Twitter, and Lorsor Penguins. Of course, I have Rob Rossi from The Athletic here. Rob, another thing I've wondered this offseason is obviously if they don't bring Jason Zucker back, they'll have to replace him. But even if they do, do you think they need a true, another big star to contend this offseason? Because that was a big thing I noticed during Kyle Dubas' introductory press conference where 
he kind of hinted that he might go make a splash for this forward who can play on the first line or the second line. I think that's a big, obviously a big one is if Zucker doesn't come back, but do you think they need another star winger or another star center to contend? No, I do not. Um, I, I think they have enough star power up front. I think what they would need is better players in the bottom six. Now, I think they could use a star either in goal, and I don't know how you assess who is because it's such a – but the other area I think is, you know, I was in favor of – when I heard about the chicken uh, possible acquisition and reported about it in The Athletic – I was for it because I thought if you could lock down a 1A defenseman to play with Chris Letang, that deepened your defense in a way so much and gave you that, that bona fide number one pairing that it's rare that you don't see teams solid with a number one pairing that go far in the playoffs. Like it, it's hard to do yeah. without that. And, um, you know, I think you would get the best version of Chris if you paired him with a guy like a Chikrin. But if, if there's a guy available out there to either be Chris's partner or be like your second, you know, your number two defenseman as anchoring your second pairing, I think that makes your defense so much better. And I think I, I think part of their struggles last year on the back end were due to P.O. Joseph not being physically ready to play a full season. Um, the uh, injuries that forced them to play depth guys way too much and out of position or up in the lineup. Uh, Petrie's injuries uh, and, you know, struggles early. And Latang just, just having a year from hell. So, you know, as as lucky as they were up front with the injuries this year, they were – I wouldn't say as uh, as unlucky in the back, but they that back end dealt with a lot. Uh, so if he could get a star or or even a elite defenseman um, to to be, uh, yes, I would do that. And um, now I'm not saying that's the way he's thinking, but I, I think they have enough star power up front to get them going. Um, um, now that said, you know. I wouldn't turn, I'm just, I wouldn't turn a, uh, an Austin Matthews down, <laughs> but, but I don't think that's a realistic thing, but, um, you know, uh, I, I think too, there's a danger in, in adding too many stars. I think you saw that with the New York Rangers this year. I, there's only one puck. Um, uh, so, yeah, that's kind of where I stand on that. Yeah, I mean, and obviously for the bottom six, I do think they need another third-line center in general. You can't run into the season with Ryan Paling and Jeff Carter as your two centers. That's just not – you need to find one either via trade or you need to find one via free agency. I assume, Rob, I've said this a lot of times on the show throughout the last couple of months, Brian Dumoulin is likely not coming back to the yeah. team um, in a couple of weeks from free agency, and that would open up a spot, Rob to play with Crystal Tang because that was his preferred partner over the years. And <clears throat> the more I think about it, the more a replacement for Dumoulin will come in via trade. You look at the free agent market. It's not that good right now. You have yeah. Orlov and, you know, I, I, I think it was Frank on daily faceoff. He said he may be looking for 8 million per season. No, thanks. You, you always overpay. Yeah. to a detriment for defensemen on the open market. It's the, and when the Penguins have gone to the open market, they had to do it um, yeah. for defensemen. It's just, it's such a premium position and such an important position. Five years it's, for Jack Johnson. <laughs> right. Yeah. And especially if you're looking for a right shot defenseman, um, you know, I mean, the, the singular reason Chris Letang got a longer deal than Evgeny Malkin, they're only a year apart. Malkin got four years. Chris got six. Why? Because the Penguins had to do that to keep Chris's number where it was. They had to add the extra term. Because if Chris had gone to the open market, whatever people in Pittsburgh think of him, you were looking at an extraordinary contract, even for a player of his age, because he's a, he's a right defenseman that still plays number one minutes. Those are gold in this league. Um, 
So, yeah, I would think he'd be looking. And that's where the Penguins, you, you know, maybe that's where the first round pick comes into play as part of a package that does that. Uh, I'd be fine with that. If you can, like, if you can package the pick with- and get an actual good player in return, I, I would do that. Yes. Yes. So I, I, I think that pick could be used one of two ways. It could be used as a way to get rid of a bad contract that gives you more cap space where maybe you then, then that gives you an opportunity to do something else to, to add players via trade or, or on the market, or that becomes part of something that you have to package to get that type of defenseman. Now, the problem Penguins are going to run into is they don't have a lot of assets other than that number one pick to do that type of a deal. Um, and let's face it, if a type of player like that becomes available via trade, there it's not like just the Penguins are going to be looking at that player. Yeah, I mean, no, you, you, you make a good point on that. You know, they will not be the only team in on a lot of some of these top trade targets. This offseason. I mean, I've thrown a few out there for partners for Chris Tang, like Matt Grizzlick, Noah Hannafin. I mean, Hannafin is going to be targeted, I think, by probably half the league. He's that good. But <clears throat> I do think that is one of their biggest needs heading into the season is getting a new partner, a true number one left shot defenseman. Because I don't – no disrespect to Marcus Pedersen. I love the guy. I don't know if he can play top pairing minutes for 82 games. And I think he, you're a better team if he is – is sort of your anchor on a second pairing. I think he's evolved to that point. He's shown that, you know, um, he can be a, he can be your number four, but he's sort of your foundational piece on that second pairing. Um, yeah. And, you know, whether he plays with Jeff Petrie, if he's still here <clears throat> or someone else, he can anchor that pairing very efficiently. Last thing, Rob, before I let you go, do you think, Dubas can do enough this off season to a get this team back into the playoffs and b make them potentially a contender going into next season. I don't want to limit him to the off season for that. Um, I think he'll do enough off season to make changes that they'll be a better team going into next season than they were at the end of last season. I want to give him at least through the trade deadline. Um, or at least up until the trade deadline, I should say, and then see how that plays out. But I, I, I think this is going to be a process that, 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 that is starting now and will go into the season in terms of how it affects this team. Um, I think primarily, and I, and I think when you're looking at hires to get back to the conversation we had in the first segment, I would imagine if they bring in another assistant GM, that GM's focus is going to be very much on the other part of Dubas's job, which is, as he said, making sure that transition between the end of this era and into the next era isn't, they're not down for too long. I think most of Dubas's efforts, you know, 95% for the next year go into the current group while keeping an eye on that other stuff. But um, laying the foundation for, for, for that. But um, I don't think Penguin fans should freak out if they go into the season where he's just made some perceived minor moves because a, like you said, Hunter, they, he's done a really good job of bringing in depth players that, that can produce. Right. Yeah. And, and those aren't always the sexiest signings. Right. Um, if anything, sometimes those signings get critical because you're like looking at a flat cap and like, is this really worth it? I I think he'll do that. I think he'll try to work on something significant. Maybe he can't get that done for going into the season. I think another benefit is I think if you go into the season without having done something dramatic this summer, that lets some of your other guys get a chance to build some momentum. To, so maybe they have more value in season if you want to make a move. Yeah, yeah, for sure. And I do think they'll potentially have more assets maybe around the trade deadline to make a move, especially with, you know, you know the four quartet of picks almost. And, you know, some pro- potentially some prospects from this draft, some prospects from the last draft. I think I, and some roster players, I think they will have, you know, pieces to make, you know, a big move potentially if they want to. But, you know, Rob, I, I really appreciate you 
taking the time to come on Thursday's episode of this podcast. Just obviously your Twitter is right down there at real mm-hmm. underscore Rob Rossi for those watching on YouTube for audio. It's right there for you all to hear. Rob, what's coming up next for the athletic for people <laughs> articles? Uh, I, yeah, I, I, Speaking for Josh and I, we're hoping to get a little bit of quiet time this week and then get going next week, to be honest. Uh, um, you know, personally, I spent a long time working on that story. Josh and I wrote about the chaos. I've been working on that for really since before the trade deadline. Um, that's still up if you want to check it out. I just had a story this week on how the Dubas thing came together. Um, I think, you know. That pizza place sounded good. I'm going to have to go to yeah. the one around near where I live. Uh, that, yeah, that there's, uh, there's one in Mount Lebanon. So, um, uh, a shout out. Il Pizziola is, 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 we used to say in my, my childhood days, the bomb, uh, <laughs> to date myself. But, um, I, I would, it's look, I think starting as soon as this weekend, you're going to start seeing us, um, you know, turn our attention to sort of trying to keep people updated and what we're hearing about, you know, penguin moves, um, I, I'm expecting it to be busy too. I'm expecting like if there is a buyout decision, I think that's going to happen relatively soon. I, I could see a situation where the goaltending decision plays itself out over the next two weeks. So there's going to be a combination of stuff we're digging for and stuff we have to sort of put into perspective. But I think it's I, it's going to be an exciting couple of weeks leading into the draft for Penguin fans. Um, and and look, I, I think too. Um, if nothing else, Dubas has energized this thing, right? Um, whatever people think of the hire, it was it, there was no energy with the last regime towards the end. So no. I think this this will be an exciting time for fans and for people that cover the team. And you know, we're going to get an early look at what Kyle Dubas really thinks of this roster. Yeah, I mean, it, I, I'm really curious to see if he does anything at the draft, big trade wise for agencies on a Saturday this year. I have off that day for my full time job, which is perfect. So I'm just going to be doing a bunch of content that day. But um, we're going to find all of this out relatively soon. And yet, the buyout period for everyone remembers it opens well. Technically, I, I guess it should open late tonight because it would be 48 hours after the cup, but they're just going to say Friday because it's just yeah. here. But that will run for two weeks, Rob. So they'll have a decision on my Kyle Granlin if they can't find a trade partner. I, you know, there's people they're not going to buy out Jeff Carter because that cap hit will just stay no matter what. Well, they can't, they can't, they can't buy out Carter because it's a 35 plus contract. Yeah. So um, the, the two buyout candidates are really Granlin and Petrie. And, you know, Granlin would make the most is, sense. is nuts because it's like 10 million for four years. I don't think right. they want to do that. Yeah. Yeah. The Granlin one, I do think they're going to very much consider. If they yeah. can, because it gives them seven million in cap space over all these next two seasons, four million. Right. Yeah, I season. think, I I think they prefer not to do that. I, I think as an organization, they just don't like doing that. But they may not have a choice on this. And and look, I don't, I I don't pretend to know Mikhail well. I didn't get to know him that well when he was with, um, during his t- months here. Um, I I do suspect it would be better for him. Um, he's always going to be linked to the Hextall era. And um, I think it would be better for him to go to a place where he's a better fit. Yeah. But I never, I just want to be clear on Mikel. I, I, I hope people don't, you know, e- even if he stays around, like he deserves a fair chance. That was a really tough situation he was put into last year. Yeah. I mean, I mean, I, obviously I wasn't a fan of his game. One yeah. garbage time goal in 20 plus games, but you know, maybe, I mean, if he does stay around and they get him some help, maybe it works out. You know, I'm still a little, you know, suspicious of it, but we'll have to see. What James Neal had two goals as before his breakout season after the trade. Now, different situation. He was younger and different type yeah. of player, but sometimes players have a hard time with that late season trade to adjust. It's one of the reasons Jim Rutherford always liked to make moves early as opposed to at the deadline to give that player more time. Yeah, that, that makes a lot of sense. And you, you always saw players – you know, get more comfortable the earlier Rutherford did make the moves, even though some were good, but some were bad. But uh, that will do it for this episode of the Locked on Penguins podcast. Rob, really appreciate you coming on. We'll look forward to your coverage along with Josh for the next couple of weeks as it's going to get pretty crazy. For Friday's show, I'm going to have Nick Berlanski and Nick Corwell on from the Tip of the Iceberg podcast. Haven't had them on in a while, but they do great work there as well. You but, guys all get along in podcast world. Why can't people in Pittsburgh with, with Pittsburgh websites be like that? 
<laughs> I know. I know. I, 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 you know, there, there are a lot of great pop podcasts. Yeah. Here, you know? I, I know I toot my own horn, but the Nick and Nick show, they, they do a great job. Yeah. You guys are all really good. I, I there's know. a lot. Penguin fans are lucky for all the podcast content out there. They really are. I appreciate it. You know, there's, there's, there's them. There's countless others that I could shout out right now. I know Danny and Taylor do a great podcast themselves. And no the issue with them. them. Yeah. No. <laughs> the Penguins Collective one is also very good. Um, Jeff, Jeff Taylor's podcast is awesome. But yeah, I really like the community that we have here. But again, that'll do it for this one. Thank you all so much for listening. Stop watching and I'll see you all on Friday.